Welcome back to Multivariate Calculus. In this video, we're going to be looking at the quadric surfaces. Quadric surfaces are an extension of the conic sections that we've talked about previously from two-dimensional curves into three-dimensional surfaces. And while we will certainly be looking at each of the six quadric surfaces individually, what I really want to focus on in this lesson are a couple of tools for understanding the structure of a two-dimensional surface in three-dimensional space. Those tools are the trace of the curve and level curves. When you first learned how to graph an equation in two variables, one of the key ideas that you learned to look for were the x-intercept and the y-intercept. These are relatively easy things to find, and they give you a lot of information about the character of the graph. The traces are exactly that idea in three dimensions. The traces of a graph are the curves formed on the xy plane, the yz plane, and the zx plane where the graph intersects the curve. So if we think about our x, y, and z axes in the usual orientation. We can think about the x, y plane, which we're going to write with the positive x axis going downward and the positive y axis going to the right. And this is what's happening when z is equal to zero. So we are in that plane. We can think about the yz plane. And we're going to draw the yz plane with the y-axis going to the right and the z-axis going upward. And the yz plane here is the space that we think about when x is equal to zero. And then finally, the zx plane, which we're going to draw with the positive x direction going to the left and the positive z direction going upward. That's this space in here, which is the space where y is equal to zero. So we're looking for the intersection of our graph in these three spaces to try to make sense of what it looks like. As an example of that analysis, let's take a look at our first quadric surface. The ellipsoid is a three-dimensional equation that looks very similar to the equation of an ellipse. Remember that an ellipse is x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared equals 1. To get an ellipsoid, we simply enter, enter in one extra term, z squared over c squared. Add all that together, we get 1. That is an ellipse. <coughs> I'm sorry. Excuse me. That is the equation of an ellipsoid. All right. So when we're talking about the traces, we're going to talk about the xy plane, which is where z is equal to zero. And if we set z equal to zero in this equation, we get x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to one. And that is exactly the equation of the ellipse that we were discussing just a moment ago. Now to try to make the graph look like it fits in with the three-dimensional graph, as we said, we want the positive y direction to go to the right, 
And then following the right hand rule, that means that the positive x direction would have to go downward. This ellipse will have extents of positive a and the opposite of a in the x direction. It will have extents of positive b and the opposite of b in the y direction. And we'll pretend that this curve that I'm drawing is a nice perfect ellipse. Then we will look at the yz plane. The yz plane is the space where x is equal to zero. And if we set x equal to zero in our equation of an ellipsoid, we get y squared over b squared plus z squared over c squared is equal to one. And we recognize that once again, this is the equation of an ellipse. All right. Setting up our y and z axes. Once again, the extents of y go from b to negative b. And then z is going to go from c to the opposite of c, which gives us a curve that looks kind of like that. And then the last trace is going to be the zx plane, which is the space where y is equal to zero. And if we set y equal to zero in our original equation, we get x squared over a squared plus z squared over c squared equals one. And once again, if you ignore the fact that it's x and z instead of x and y, this is exactly the equation of an ellipse. We don't have any surprises here, but we can set up our graph so that we have our z axis will be pointing upward, our x axis will be pointing uh, leftward in this case, we will go from A to the opposite of A, and we will go from C to the opposite of C and get a curve that looks kind of something like that. By orienting the axes in this way, it becomes a little bit easier to see how this is going to translate into the usual three-dimensional space where we have, of course, z pointing up and y pointing to the right, and then x is pointing kind of down and to the left. So we've got one set of axes where x is pointed down, the other one where x is pointed to the left. And we can kind of sort of try to draw what these things are going to look like and get some sort of curves that look like that. And I don't know, maybe that makes sense to you. It doesn't make any sense to me. So instead of trying to do this by hand, let's jump to the computer. In order to get this into GeoGebra, we need to pick some specific values. We can't plot things in general. So let's pick a value like A equals three, B equals two, and C equals one, and go ahead and graph that. So what I've done here, you can see that currently the equation of the surface itself is turned off and I have all of my traces graphed in three-dimensional space. The equations here are kind of nasty, but all I've done is set one of the variables equal to t, generally either x or y, uh, set the variable equal to zero that is equal to zero, and then solve that equation for the last variable. It involves a square root, so we have a plus or minus, which is why we have a bunch of different curves here. All right, I've got the positive branch of the uh, yz plane. I've got the negative branch of the yz plane as separate things. Likewise, the uh, xz plane and the xy plane, positive and negative branches. But if I set this in motion a little bit, 
we can start to get a sense of how those traces in the XZ plane, in the YZ plane, and in the XY plane turn into this three-dimensional structure. And you can start to get the sense of the kinds of ellipses that are going on. So being able to look at the traces and try to understand what this thing is going to look like in three dimensions is in and of itself an interesting goal in this course. But we have computer software, we can fill in and we can look at the graph and we can see that no matter which cross section we look at, this graph is going to have a cross section which is an ellipse. Sometimes it's an ellipse that's tilted at an angle, sometimes it's an ellipse that is straight, sometimes it is wider, sometimes it is narrower, but it is, no matter how you look at it, always an ellipse. And that's how it gets the name of the ellipsoid. All right, back to my notes. And let's play around with a couple of others here. If I take my standard equation for an ellipse that I was just looking at and take one of the terms and turn it from positive to negative, when we study the conic sections, that takes us from an ellipse to a hyperbola. The same idea is going to work here as we work to study the three-dimensional shapes. If I simply take one of those terms and turn it from positive to negative, we get a shape known as the hyperboloid of one sheet. <coughs> Once again, we're going to study the hyperboloid of one sheet by first looking at its traces. When z is equal to zero, we get x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to one. That's the same ellipse that we saw before. If we look at the yz plane, that's the points where x is equal to zero, we will get y squared over b squared minus z squared over c squared is equal to 1. Right. And with y positive, z negative, we end up with the hyperbola that opens in the y direction. And then finally, when y is equal to zero, we get the zx plane. Getting ahead of myself. We'll have x squared over a squared minus z squared over c squared is equal to one. And once again, because x is positive and z is negative, we are going to end up with a hyperbola that opens in the x direction. And so trying to put these together, again, trying to visualize this, you can see that we've got these ellipses looking downward. And then notice here, <coughs> 
that there is nothing near the z axis. So we can kind of start to visualize that this thing is going to form a shape that is some sort of a hollow tube. To get a picture that actually fits into the screen nicely, in this case, I'm going to pick that A is equal to two, B is equal to one, and C is equal to three. For the hyperboloid of one sheet, um, if I didn't mention it, we can set this up in any orientation so that we have a tube around the z-axis, around the x-axis, around the y-axis, whichever one we set as negative. But it turns out that the graph is a lot easier to understand when that has the largest parameter going with it. All right, so with that, let me jump over to GeoGebra. And once again, you can see that I've taken my traces, I parameterized them, and I've graphed them in three dimensions so that we can kind of have a look around and get some idea of how this is supposed to work. You can see that nice center point is held out and all of these um, support ribs going off in different directions. To really get a sense of it, let's fill that in and put in the curve itself. And you can get the sense of how in the cross sections we have hyperbolas but in the downward cross section we have an ellipse instead all right so that is a hyperboloid of one sheet i guess if we're going to have a hyperboloid of one sheet it makes sense that we should probably also have a hyperboloid of two sheets And for the hyperboloid of two sheets, instead of having two positive terms and one negative term, we're going to have one positive term and two negative terms. And again, you can choose to set this up in any order and you will still get a hyperboloid of two sheets. The traditional way of setting this up is to have the X and Y terms negative and then the Z term positive. And once again, we can start off looking at the traces. Z equals zero is the interesting case. This is where something weird is going to start happening. The left-hand side of this equation, when we said Z equal to zero, we have x, a, y, and b all being squared. So they are all positive numbers. And then we're subtracting these things. This left-hand side has to be non-positive. It could be zero, it's usually negative, but there is no way you can set anything in here and get a positive thing out. Because you take positive divided by positive and then the opposite, that's negative. You take positive divided by positive, take the opposite, that's negative. Then you add two negative things together, you get a negative result. You can never get positive one out. A non-positive value can never be positive one, so there is no solution. This three-dimensional graph does not exist in the xy plane. That's weird. We can still look at the other traces. If we set x equal to zero, we can get the yz plane, which is going to be the space where z squared over c squared minus y squared over b squared is equal to one. All right, this is a hyperbola. 
Z is positive, so it's going to be a hyperbola that opens upward and downward. And then if you set Y equal to zero, you get Z squared over C squared minus X squared over A squared is equal to one. And this is again a hyperbola. Z is positive, so it's going to open along the Z direction, not along the X direction. And you can get some feel for what this curve is going to look like with just that. Right. We've looked at a couple of things where A, B, and C vary in size to get a sense of how the ellipse uh, can play a part in this. But let's simplify things now and just look at A equals B equals C equals 1. And once again, let's jump over to three dimensions where we can look at this structure. And if you look at the X, Z planes, and you look at the Y, Z plane, you can see our hyperbolas are set up, kind of a bowl holding things up above, a bowl holding things down below. And if we fill in with the curve, you can get that sense. We have these kind of bowl-shaped looking things with a space between. That's why it's called the hyperboloid of two sheets. The cross sections are hyperbolas and there's a gap in the middle where we have two separate surfaces that aren't touching each other. If I change the values of A and B, when I looked down here, I would see an ellipse instead of a perfect circle. Uh, that's the basic idea on this thing. <clears throat> there is kind of a degenerate case somewhere between the two hyperboloids. If you think about this kind of in a transitory sense, when you have a hyperboloid of one sheet with a curve like this, Think about pinching that center of the curve in more and more until it hits where it's just at one point and then it snaps. And then you have these two curves, if I can get my hands to actually do that, that are separated from each other with a space in the middle. And there is a way to get to that degenerate state of the point. It turns out that that happens when the constant, which is one in this case, disappears from the equation. So if we take our hyperboloids and set that constant equal to one, we will get a shape known as an elliptic cone. This is where we have x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to z squared over c squared. And if we think about the traces here, the xy plane is where z is equal to zero. We get that x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to zero. Using the same argument we had before about the sign, S-I-G-N, x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared can never be uh, negative. It's always going to be a positive value, except in the case where everything is zero. So there's exactly one solution to this equation. It's the point zero, zero, zero. In the yz plane, where x is equal to zero, we get that y squared over b squared is equal to z squared over c squared, which I can rearrange and write as y equals plus or minus b over c times z. The graph there is two straight lines. I didn't quite give myself enough space to draw the graph out. Right? The graph there is two straight lines, and if I'm very careful in how I draw them, I can draw them so that they are, in fact, going through the origin. 
And then the xz plane where y is equal to zero, we get that x squared over a squared is equal to z squared over c squared, which again, we can write as x equals plus or minus a over c times z. which once again is two straight lines. Depending on the parameters we get, we have something that's going to possibly vary in size. Let's jump over to the graph. I'm not going to even bother drawing in the traces. We can see here from a side on view that we get these straight lines. And if we tilt this thing, you can start to get the sense that it is in fact a circular cone. Um, I chose the value once again with all the parameters equal to one. I could have set something equal to another number. Right? If I go up here and I put a four in for x, you can see that suddenly we've got a very wide looking cone and you can get the sense of the ellipse that the cross section turns into instead of being the uh, nice perfect circles. Right. But that's the degenerate case of the elliptic cone where we suddenly don't have a constant term. Things start to get interesting there. And we can keep going. We've already gotten rid of the constant term. Why not get rid of some more stuff? So we had z squared equals x squared plus y squared. What if we got rid of one of those squares and we just have that z is equal to x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared. This is going to give us a shape called an elliptic paraboloid. And we can again start by analyzing the traces. When z is equal to zero, we get that x squared over a squared plus y squared over b squared is equal to zero, which again gives us that 1.000. When x is equal to zero, we get that z is equal to y squared over a squared. That's the equation of a parabola. And when y is equal to zero, we get that z is equal to x squared over a squared, which is once again, a parabola that opens in the z direction. One thing that you probably noticed in the elliptic cone, and it's going to be even worse with the elliptic paraboloid, is that without anything of interest in one of the axes, it's kind of difficult to see the cross section of what's happening in the x, y plane. So before I jump and graph this thing, I want to look at another tool that we can use for describing a three-dimensional graph. That other tool is known as the level curve. For level curves, instead of just picking a single value for z, we pick a couple of values of z. Right? We got z equals 0 already. We might also try z equals 1. Or z equals 2. And we could keep going. We could try z equals three and so on. These are all two dimensional graphs. I'm going to jump into uh, GeoGebra's two dimensional graphing tool and just look at these for a moment before we go on to analyze it in three dimensions. All right, so here we are. The equations ended up slightly out of order, but you can see that I've graphed the level curves 
for z equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. I happen to have chosen that a equals 1 and b equals 1 over the square root of 2 in order just to have something that gives us some shape to this graph. And with level curves, we're looking at uh, equal steps, and that's the key idea. If you've ever uh, studied a topographic map, uh, this is exactly that idea, a topographic uh, map of an abstract space. So as you're looking at this, each of these curves is a level ring, right? So imagine a hill or a valley, and you're just tracing along on the horizon everywhere that is the exact same height and trying to draw it out on the graph and see what you come up with. So some things that you can look at here are that we are going in these concentric circles. So we know we have a shape that's kind of dome-like just from that. Paying attention to the labels, z equals 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4, we see that we're going upward with our dome, not downward. Right? So that's something that's often difficult to understand in a topographic map. <coughs> Excuse me. So pay attention to those labels. The other thing that I want to pay attention to is that the curves are equally spaced, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4. The vertical distance going from here to here and the vertical distance going from here to there are exactly the same. So we can see that down here, we are much shallower and up here, we are much steeper. We can also see that going across in the Y direction is a shallower curve and going in the X direction is a steeper curve and the spaces in between are something in between. So there's a good bit of information we can get just by looking at these curves. All right, I'm going to switch back over to the notes for just a second, and then we're going to go ahead and look at this same shape in three dimensions. All right, here I am now in three dimensions, and if I change the angle of this thing into the shape that we had been looking at, you can see that it's the same kinds of level curves. I only have one, two, and three. I don't have the fourth one graphed because the three-dimensional graph takes a lot more space. But we can look at these curves in three dimensions and understand how they stack compared to each other. I can also put my traces in, right? So I have the parabola that shows up in the XZ plane and in the YZ plane, I uh, have those graphed as well, so we can play around with what's going on. And that gives a very strong sense of what this curve is going to look like before I fill in with that extra bit of detail. All right. The elliptic paraboloid is this cup shaped looking thing there's nothing below the xy plane, just like with a parabola, everything always opens upward. Um, so kind of an interesting thing in that regard alone. All right. But I want to look at one more shape here. I called this the elliptic paraboloid, which kind of gives the sense that there might be another. The curve that we had, the elliptic paraboloid, had a right-hand side that was very much the formula for an ellipse. If we simply change that plus sign to a minus sign, the right-hand side has a form that looks more like something you would see in a hyperbola. And this one 
I actually want you to go through the work on. I want you to think about how the traces and the level curves help inform the shape of the object. So let's take a look at a specific version of this. I'll use the same numbers we used for the last problem. So we'll have z equals x squared minus 2y squared. I want you to find the traces on this equation. I want you to find the level curves. And this one actually can have some negative values of z as well. So I want you to look at z equals negative 2, negative 1, 0, 1, and 2. Graph those five level curves all in the same coordinate space. Then, graph the surface, all right? So we have three traces, which are going to be three separate graphs, two-dimensional graphs. We have level curves, which are going to be five curves on a single two-dimensional graph, and then the three-dimensional graph of the surface. If you're feeling ambitious, try to get the uh, curves, the level curves and the traces parameterized so you can graph those in three dimensions, but I don't necessarily expect that of you. See what you can do with this problem, and I'll see you in the next video.